The Forgotten Role of Female Athletes' Activism Female Athlete Activism in the 1960s by Alex Embarrass Setting the Stage In the early 1900s, a worldwide women's movement was demanding political inclusion. The United States in 1920 passed the 19th Amendment, giving women full voting rights. The times were changing, but they weren't changing the Olympics. Behind the scenes, some IOC Olympic International Committee members were quietly moving to expand women participations, but IOC President Coubertin continued to insist on the marginalization of women's sports. After the 1912 Stockholm Games, he and many of his IOC colleagues believed, quote, an Olympiad with females would be impractical, uninteresting, unesthetic, and improper. However, none of this sexism is mentioned as an Olympic profile. Pierre de Coubertin is widely regarded as the founder of the modern Olympic Games, a man who, quote, devoted his life to education, history, and sociology, and in 1894 he founded the IOC to help build a peaceful and better world by educating young people through sport. The first Olympic Games of the modern era were held in 1896 in Athens. It wasn't until the 1928 Amsterdam game, the first without Coubertin at the helm, that a drastic rise in women, women's participation was seen. Almost 300 women took part in the games thanks largely to the exclusion of a small slate of women's track and field events. However, following the Amsterdam games, citing medical evidence, the IOC ruled that the 800 meter run was too dangerous. Anti-feminists argued that women were too frail to run such distances, and remarkably, their views won out. Women were not allowed to compete in the 800-meter run until the 1960 Olympic Games, a historic Olympics discussed later on in the presentation. To challenge IOC sexism, women and their allies organized an alternative games, a vital yet largely forgotten act of political dissent. Everywhere women looked, the Olympic cards were stacked against them. The IOC, as led by Coubertin, opposed women's full participation. As the minutes of their general body meeting in 1914 st clearly state, quote, no women to participate in track and field, but as before, allowed to participate in fencing and swimming. Discrimination was baked into the man master plans. That was before Alice Milant, a French athlete and activist whose bold actions created a clear path for women's participation in the game. After the exclusion of women from track and field in 1920, Milant founded the Fédération Sportive Féminine Internationale on October 31, 1921. At the first FSFI meeting, the group voted to establish the Women's Olympics as an alternative to the male-centric games. On the slide, you can view the dates and locations of those games. Before the 1960s, the United States was in a period of conformity during the 50s where both men and women observed strict gender roles and complied with society's expectations. While this was all happening, one of the most prolific and accomplished tennis champions rose up, Althea Gibson, and became the first man or woman African American to participate on the Grand Slam stages. More information about women's games can be found in the book, Power Games, A Political History of the Olympics. Setting the Stage Althea Gibson Harlem raised Althea Gibson won 11 majors in three years from 1956 to 1958. She integrated two sports, tennis and golf, during an era of strict racial segregation in the United States. She is our Jackie Robinson, says tennis legend Billie Jean King. Over the years, the United States Tennis Association has paid tribute to Billie Jean King, for whom the Tennis Center at Flushing Meadows, New York is named, and Arthur Ashe, for whom there is both a statue and a stadium that bears his name. Virtually nothing has been done on the grounds to honor Gibson's legacy. The 1956 French Open Championship saw her become the first man or woman African American to win a Grand Slam title. In 1957, she won the women's single at Wimbledon, marking yet another first. She was the first African American to play at the iconic tournament. Gibson had broken the color barrier at the highest level of tennis and would go on to become the first black player to be ranked number one in the world. This is not just a player who won a lot of titles. This is someone who transcended our sport and opened the pathway for people of color, said Katrina Adams, the first African-American USTA president. If there was no Althea, there'd be no me. After winning Wimbledon in 1957 and accepting the trophy from Queen Elizabeth II, a ticker tape parade up Broadway in New York awaited her return. Gibson also appeared on the covers of Sports Illustrated in Time that year, the first black woman to do so. 
Shaking hands with the Queen of England, she wrote in I Always Wanted to Be Somebody, her 1958 autobiography, was a long way from being forced to sit in the colored section of the bus. Althea Gibson is the first example of women, particularly African-American women, whose contributions to sports and activism have long been ignored that I uncovered in my research. Further exemplifying her historical significance is her travels throughout Southeast Asia on a U.S. State Department tour. In 1956, State Department official Harold Howland explained in a letter to the editors of Sports Illustrated that athletes were essential to American diplomacy. Athletes, he argued, held as much cultural merit as leaders in the arts and politics. We believe that if we send abroad great men like Robert Foss, William Faulkner, Chief Justice Earl Warren, and many others from various walks of American life, great sportsmen like Jesse Owens, Sammy Lee should go too, to present a balanced picture of the American scene. Yet Howland's illustrations was imbalanced. He said nothing of the American women, many of whom were tennis players like Althea Gibson, who served as State Department athletes. Althea Gibson won four championship titles while on tour of Southeast Asia between 1955 and 1956 that Howland had arranged. The State Department sponsored amateur women tennis players as goodwill ambassadors to portray the achievements of American women, the opportunities available to them, and the gender and racial equality in American life, though this was far from the truth. Gibson sought to inspire her country's equal treatment through athletic achievement and symbolic representation. Historian Lewis Moore in his book, We Will Win This Day, The Civil Rights Movement, The Black Athlete, and the Quest for Equality, examines how African-American athletes have used sport to fight for equality, focusing on the period between 1945 and 1968. Moore traces how discourse shifted from African-American athletes in the 1950s as evidence of democracy in action to fist up in the air revolt of the black athlete in the 60s. In, the 60s. in this exploration, Moore foregrounds groundbreaking tennis star Althea Gibson in our first female activist of the 1960s, Olympic gold medal winning sprinter Wilma Rudolph. Rumoff, Rudolph embodied the change of the 60s with her vocal and direct action in confronting inequality and sought power in collective political protest. 